views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. On this edition of today's verdict, recently we have seen our share of civil unrest take over the streets of New York City and beyond. Assembly members Catalina Cruz and Michael Blake have written a strong opinion piece published in the New York Times stating that the Bronx and Queens are crying out for help. They will both be on the show to tell us how their constituents have been left behind over the last few months. Also, Robert Jenis, a well-known and respected trial attorney, will be here to walk us through the new normal that is now a part of the New York City civil judicial system, including the use of virtual depositions and how to prepare your clients for this new normal. And finally, State Senator Alessandra Biaggi has introduced a game-changing bill seeking to demilitarize the police in New York State. What does this mean? And will it pass? As you can see, we have much to get to, so stay tuned. Today's verdict starts right now. State Senator Alessandra Biaggi. Um, first of all, it's nice to see you again. It's been a couple of weeks. You've been busier than anyone else I've ever seen, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Uh, last time we spoke, there were some issues in the community about uh, COVID mm -hmm. and the disproportionate um, health consequences. Tell me, have things gotten a little bit better for your constituents? Things have gotten a little bit better. And I just want to say thank you again for having me back on because it's important for anyone tuning in to know like what's happening in real time, especially for right those of us who are like on the ground in the trench trying to really solve so many of the problems. So since we last spoke, things have definitely gotten better. Um, however, however, what we have seen is that the Bronx has been the borough that has been the hardest hit. Whether it has to do with the highest cases or the highest number of deaths, we still have 1.9 million New Yorkers who are out of work. They're unemployed. We still have a lot of businesses, small businesses, big businesses that are closed because we're not fully opened in New York City. As you know, right, we're in phase one, which just started on Monday. So we have a long way to go. And I think that any of the problems that we had pre-COVID, like people trying to make their rent payments, people trying to put food on the table, right? There's a huge food insecurity, having access to health care. They were exacerbated in a way that we cannot, we can never ignore. And so it's our responsibility now coming through this. Hopefully we don't have another surge, hopefully. Which leads us to the next phase, which, you know, the protesting that's been going on in the city, which can, we can have some wonderful changes that occur. And obviously you're behind a very, very important bill. I love it here. S8512, tell us about the bill, if you could. So for just for everyone who is um, watching, you know, the protests have inspired a lot of lawmakers across the country to share resources, whether it's online, through Twitter, Facebook, different means and different methods. Um, and so I've taken a lot of what my colleagues across the country and state governments have done and really read through them and combed through them to see what's missing in New York. How can we make New York City as well as New York State? safer. And so S8512 is a bill that I just introduced this week. Um, and basically what it says is that no law enforcement agency can use a chemical incapacitant. So what does that really mean in like layman's terms? It means we're banning tear gas. Tear gas is something that is um, and is and has been known to cause um, blindness, coughing, um, lung irrita irritation. It has made people very sick. Um, and also it has been banned in our war zones for many different years, which makes someone like myself think to think, why do our police departments have tear gas if they're actually, we're not allowed to use tear gas on the war field. So it's an interesting, um, I think, time right now to rethink and reimagine what it looks like to police. And this is one of those ways. And if we're looking at the um, entire landscape of, you know, protests from when they've begun and they're still going on and we're watching the videos that we see on Twitter and through, you know, shared, shared text messages and just really witnessing what's happening, we're seeing as those who are tear gassed become very sick. And, and, I, you know, it's not lost on me that we're still in a pandemic, which means that if 
you're sprayed with tear gas and you have to take your mask off and you're coughing because tear gas, tear gas causes coughing. Are we're increasing our risk of spreading COVID nineteen, and so you know it kind that that to me also makes absolutely no sense that we would be using that during a pandemic. But again, this is a resource that our police departments use, and so we just ought to do the right thing and remove that. I'm an attorney like you, so I'm wearing a different cap now, and I say, well, wait a second, you know, you have a crowd here; they're um, they're 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 maybe breaking into different into different businesses. We don't know how to control them. We need them to disperse. They're not listening to us. We can't just wave our hands and say, please, you got to go home. Senator, what would you expect us to do? What do you answer? How do you answer? I mean, listen, the police department, especially the NYPD, but police departments across the entire state have access to alternative ways of, of controlling the crowd. They have, first of all, first and foremost, communication methods, right? Like how come the first act or action is to throw tear gas to control people, why is there no good faith effort to communicate, right? How about using their patrol systems to say, everybody please back up? There, I, I don't think I've seen one video at all that actually even had any police officer saying that. I, I'm sure that there that it exists in the universe of videos, but the point I'm just trying to make is that you know if somebody is doing something that they view as illegal or is harming the public. They also have batons. They can put somebody under arrest. The use of tear gas is taking it so it, taking it to a level that we don't need to be taking it. And also it increases the untrustworthiness from the public to the police department. And I think that if we're in the moment we're in right now, which I know we are because we just passed historic legislation in the state legislature in New York, then let's, get into that. let's talk a little bit about Let's get a little bit into that that new legislation. So sure. important, 58. You got behind it. Talk about that if you could. Okay. So for those who don't know, there uh, there have been a, probably about a decade's worth of bills when it comes to police reform um, that have been pending in the New York State Legislature for many different reasons. Some could say political. Some could say you know there's other reasons, but. The main crux of the, the package that we put forward, the police accountability and reform package that we put forward, really was premised upon and, and relied upon the passage of 50A. 50A, the repeal of 50A, which is what we did yesterday, um, was a historic piece of legislation because what it now means is that if a police officer is charged with something or somebody makes a claim against them for any reason, it could be anything at all, their records of misconduct are now made open to the public. Now, the argument on the other side of it was, well, that's not fair. And you know, why are we doing this to police officers? Here's the thing. Police officers are public servants, just like I am, right? I am a state senator. I'm, a, I'm an elected official. But at the end of the day, I'm a public servant, which means that inherent to being a public servant is transparency. So what we have seen in the police department is that the lack of transparency has led to a lack of accountability. And a, with a lack of accountability, we have seen a lack of justice. So we know that when you have accountability, when you have transparency, not only do you allow for justice, but you increase the trust of the public. And again, let me just remind everyone, inherent to being an elected official is that transparency, right? That is what it means. Everything that we do is open to the public because that is who we serve. And also it is the taxpayers who pay us, who pay the NYPD. And so we've, we've made the standard of police officers and their their behavior open to the public because we do not want any police officers to be able to hide behind bad behavior. There's been a tailwind, obviously, that's really pushing this movement. Um, you want to call it, you know, just an anti-police movement. You just want to call, you know, power more of the people movement. However you want to, you know, the Black Lives Movement, the entire movement. Do you think it's going to continue? Do you think it's going to really push itself for so many more bills that come through like this? Or do you think it's going to unfortunately stall? What's your final thoughts on that? So I am an eternal optimist. <laughs> it is probably why I'm able to get up in the morning, despite how awful the world sometimes is. And if there is anything that we have learned, it is that when people come out into the streets and use their voices collectively, the collective can achieve anything. Correct. There is so much power in people 
coming out and speaking and holding accountable the leaders of the community. And so if I am putting on my optimistic hat, which is what I wear all the time, um, I do believe that it will continue because here's the thing. New York is one state out of 50, right? We still have a whole bunch of states who still need to take action and measures to make their police departments and otherwise more accountable and, and more transparent. And so we cannot go back to normal. There is no normal. And I think that we saw that after you know we hit the peak in COVID that everyone kept saying, well, when are we going to go back to normal? There is no normal, no. right? We're entering into a new world. And so this is the portal of transformation that honestly, it's like a once in a hundred, if not 200 year opportunity to recreate a world that really hasn't worked for so many people. And so it is up to us to keep it up. It is up to us to keep the pressure on. I mean, you know, it's it's really interesting, I think, legislating in this environment because I do identify so much with the protesters and like the activists and, and all the people who are rising up. And I bring that energy into the room with my colleagues and I can see that it makes a difference. And so- and we, You it, know what? We love the energy here. And we <laughs> expect you to come back because I know there's gonna be more and more energy. You're doing great work. You're one of our favorites. Thank we got to go. Awesome. All right. Thank you for having but, me. But again, it's always a pleasure. All right. We will we'll be back with more today's verdict right after this. Back, we're here with um, Assembly members Catalina Cruz and Michael Blake. First of all, let's start with you, Catalina. Thanks so much for being here. How are you doing today? Thank you for having us, uh, David. I think we're um, it's a little bit surreal. We're reeling in from one of the, what I believe is one of our major wins, um, not just this year, but I think it's going to be one of those things that you remember for your entire political career. Um, and that's the repeal of 50A. So we're still, you know, uh, enjoying that win while still getting ready to com continue the fight. I think the word surreal is uh, certainly the best way to sum it up. Um, your article, yours and Michael's article in the New York Times, which is um, in the opinion, um, uh, section uh, yesterday, the Bronx and Queens are crying out for help, which, you know, I'm, you know, I had said to you off ca camera, you know, I'm born and bred in Queens. I'm, you know, now working in the Bronx forever. Um, it hurts just to like read it because it really hits me hard. Was there an impetus in terms of writing this? Is there something that made you really want to get out there and put this from pen to paper? Look, I think, um, and Mike can, can speak a little bit about that too, but we had been feeling increasingly frustrated um, with not being heard. I mean, think about um, how the pandemic progressed and who was getting help and who was not. That goes uh, from, from the everyday people to the small businesses, to us, to the fact that when the city went into a lockdown, electeds found out at the same time as everybody else, when we should have been told before, we know our communities on the ground so that we could help. And so it's just this, this sense, for, at least for me, of utter frustration with the, um, because it was a lack of leadership in the city and in the state. They're leading the way they want to lead. This has certainly made it much tougher. Is there, you know, something that you feel that you want to let the public know in terms of how the government in certain respects has let your constituents down. Where, where did you see it the most? Was it the financial? Was it, you know, was it the physical? Where did you see it? It's a competition between all of them, unfortunately. You know, I represent a constituency where that depends on daily labor, where folks are working um, as domestic workers, as street vendors. Many of them are undocumented. Some of them are small business owners where if you don't work that day, you don't get money, you don't get to eat, and you don't get to pay rent. You know, uh, I, I had to resort, if it wasn't for Mike, and I want to give him a shout out because he connected me with the folks who helped give us our food. If it wasn't for that, I don't know where I would be finding folks uh, the food that they need. We are one of the only districts without a permanent, Every day open, food pantry. How does that happen? This, this particular quote, since March, coronavirus has brought financial and physical devastation. Tell me where you've seen it. Have you seen it? Because um, you've been on the front lines there. Uh, is, it, is it just, is it the health? Is it the food? Is it, is it the businesses failing? Tell me where you really see it the most. I lost one of my boys, 46 years old, uh, a Verizon employee. Uh, and, and so Zeke, you know, I, I hope they're smiling down on the work we're doing now. You know, this is that uh, reality 
Uh, there was a pandemic of poverty, uh, a pandemic of health disparities, and a pandemic of institutionalized racism before coronavirus hit. And so, you know, when you think about how our small businesses over by Third Avenue Business Improvement District had a 51% foot traffic drop in 24 hours. Uh, when you think about the immigrant entrepreneurs who didn't get any money from the federal government uh, because of the clear intentionality of helping the bigger banks. Uh, when you see that we had students uh, who didn't get help from education, you know, all these pieces are intertwined. Uh, and so what we did in the Bronx, uh, we've launched the Bronx Community Relief Effort. Uh, and because we were tired of waiting, you know, you shouldn't be waiting for food. You shouldn't be waiting for a job. Shouldn't be waiting for unemployment insurance. Uh, and, and equally, you know, the last few weeks, uh, because of the George Floyd protests and riots itself, um, further crystallizes, David, because look, you had people that were willing to go outside, understand coronavirus still happening, but they felt that they had to for justice. Uh, and it may be if we got PPE to the healthcare heroes instead of to a militarized police force, uh, that's what we should be doing. Uh, and so, you know, too many times our communities are, are further behind. Uh, and, and this is one of those moments where the Bronx and Queens uh, is getting along. No Yankees Mets uh, rivalry happening here. Right. Uh, we're able to bring it home uh, because to, what we saw is that immigrant communities are being left behind uh, and, and it was time to be something more. Kathleen, let me ask you a question. Uh, a lot of the undocumented, it looks like they're afraid to either get to the hospitals, um, their businesses, they're afraid to sometimes to go to work. Um, what have you been hearing from the community? Do you, does it look like they're getting some type of support from anybody? Look, every day I'm still getting folks in our office asking, how do I get help through those $20 million that the mayor promised? I've referred people to, a, to these organizations, but nobody seems to be getting that money. Nobody seems to be actually benefiting from those promises. Um, we began, uh, what was that, March 17th or so to provide these meals out of our offices and, and, and Mike out of several restaurants and even delivery. And we um, have not really seen a slowdown. Um, I, I suspect that sometime in the next week or, so, or two, we might see a small decrease Increase, but at least for my folks, a lot of them don't qualify for unemployment. A lot of their businesses are closed, so they're still going to need the food. It's just insane that um, that basically we've had to rely on charity because our government has failed to do the thing that government is supposed to do, which is protect people. Michael, which leads me to the next question. Our leadership, mayor, governor, you have any thoughts on you know, whether you believe they've done a good job or bad job, what, is, what are your thoughts on that? There was a lot of failed opportunities for leadership. Uh, and, and many of us on the ground had to step up. You know, when you think about that, there were loans being given out to small businesses. They needed grants immediately. Uh, you think about in the middle of all this, uh, many of us, Catalina and myself included, voted against the budget uh, because the budget had Medicaid cuts uh, and had bail rollbacks. Uh, and, and, and it made no sense at all. There was no new money for public housing, no increased money on public education. And, and why is that all intertwined? Because you're telling communities to be socially distant. How do you social distant when you have five or six people in a home? Uh, how do you tell people to keep waiting? And so what we all had to do was to step up and push further. Uh, and this is that moment where I think it's important. Uh, what someone did during the middle of a crisis shows you what kind of elected official they are, shows you what kind of leader they are. And especially, what do you do for the most vulnerable uh, who need the help the most? You know, oftentimes I've been saying, you know, it should not be easy to have unleaded gas and lead free paint. Uh, it, it's that kind of reality that we were all facing. And so uh, the, the op ed that Catalina and I did together uh, showed that, you know, we may come from different boroughs, different zip codes, we all may speak different languages, but we're all on the same journey. You know, we do just want to help our people. Do you think this is going to be the final impetus for change? you know, where we really can get someplace we need to be? Or is it just going to be another lip service where we just, we talk a good game, but it never gets there? Can we finally get there, do you think? We're going to keep going. Uh, this won't be the end. Uh, because uh, what we've seen in, in the last two weeks is that people took the pain of George Floyd and turned it to promise. You know, uh, what we've seen is that people said, you know what, we're going to make improvements on the congressional legislation uh, now with the HEROES Act. People have said, let's focus on what's happening on the ground. And we can't stop because this is not going to be healed easily. You know, we're, we're going to have waves. We're going to have multiple delays. And, you know, if, if you've been battling injustice for decades, it's not going to be resolved in a few weeks.
completely agree. All right, Ca Catalina, some final thoughts for you. Um, <laughs> where do you think we're heading here? Um, I, you know, we got another, I think, at least three, four months of the coronavirus and, and testing. And who knows if there's even going to be a vaccine anytime soon. Where do you think we're going with respect to our community? Look, I, I, I will say that I have seen this uh, awakening of folks who um, in part see what Mike is saying, who is really out there helping in a time of need and in part are holding folks accountable for their failures to act or they themselves are, are, are finding this, this uh, need to make sure that we're protecting each other. I've said this several times. When folks are like, oh, when are we going to go back to how we were? We are never going back to how we were. Why would we want to go back to the place where folks would vote for somebody to be incarcerated in the middle of COVID to save their seat, for example? I want to be a part of a legislature. I want to be a part of a nation. I want to be part of a community where we continuously put people first. And I think that's where we're going. The, the time where politics, the time where power takes over our decisions is gone. Oh. Now is where you get to see who's really fighting for people. And we're going to actually do it. Well, well said. All right. Uh, Catalina Cruz, Michael Blake, assembly members. Uh, I want to thank you very much for being on. And hopefully the next time we see both of you, it'll be in the studio. What do you think? Thank you. Look, look forward to it. Thank you, David. All right. My pleasure. All How, right, does, it go? How does it go? Does it go like this? Like there, this? You go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That makes me happy right there. there All right. We'll be back with more Today's Verdict right after this. <laughs> there, there, there you go. Bye, everyone. Right. Robert Jenis, one of my favorite attorneys, favorite trial attorneys in the world, to be honest with you, a friend to the show. Love having him back. Wish it was in the studio, but obviously we're coming from home. Uh, first of all, Bob, you, you are like the um, trial attorney extraordinaire. Obviously, you haven't been in a courtroom in a while. Tell me, um, tell me how you feel. Well, it kind of stinks being a trial lawyer who can't go on trial right now. Do you see virtual trials happening? I mean, actually, well, full trials with jurors is that a possibility? Th there is discussion about it, but there's there's a lot of problems because. You know, the jury's supposed to have no distractions, right? If you're on trial and if a juror looks at their cell phone, they take it away. What do you do in their home? And you don't know what they're doing, who they're talking to, what they're looking at. There's a new landscape now, obviously. Uh, the show must go on. Maybe there, are no, there aren't trials, but certainly there's discovery, which leads us to depositions. And I, obviously, we know what a deposition is. Hopefully, the, the uh, viewers know. Virtual depositions. Tell me what's been going on. Okay, I've done a bunch of them and I've been teaching some continuing legal education classes on it. The bottom line is your client, just like we're doing this right now, that's what your client is doing with the defense attorney questioning them or me questioning the defendant. So there's different things because it is different. A, for your preparation, you're not going to prep face to face. So you have to prep on Zoom or whatever medium you're using like we are right now. Uh, so A, can the client do it? And do your prep and get them to get used to it a little bit. Second of all, you have to be a little more organized in advance. A lot of times in the old days, meaning pre-COVID, you would take out uh, documents last second and throw it at the witness and start questioning them on it. Now you've got to pick your evidence, so to speak, in advance, exchange it, have it pre-marked. Now practice tip, let's assume you had a client with a trip and fall case and they fell because of a defect in the sidewalk. Now a practice tip is circle on the photo in advance pre-market for ID in advance, that's where they fell. Now that's the document that gets exchanged. That's the document they get questioned on. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So that's just practice tip there. Also, both the lawyer and perhaps the client, but more so the lawyer has to practice accessing, opening and sharing the documents, whether it's a photo, a medical record, an accident report, anything. Next, your client. They are on there. Now, right now, the way it's been done is it is not being recorded. It is not supposed to be recorded. You're allowed to do a video deposition of someone and record it, but you have to comply with as a court rule, uh, 22 New York CRR 202.15, where it has to be strictly complied with. If that has not been done, it cannot be recorded. However, they are evaluating and assessing your client. So, for example, how do they look? Does their hair look nice? Are they dressed appropriately? What's in the background? Like when I look at your background, Dave, it's a lovely background. So look at the advantage now you have for your client. Maybe they have beautiful family photos, diplomas, awards, honors. 
let that be in the background, okay? Um, if you don't have a good background, you can have virtual backgrounds. They could be, I could be in a courtroom. When I do my Zoom conferences and depositions, my background is I'm in a courtroom. Uh, do, do, you, do you ask the clients to put a virtual background behind them while they're being questions? Because you're obviously not in the same room. You're not in the same room. If you don't have a good background, real background for your client, that's an idea. Also, be very careful about contraband, okay? Let's assume not your client naturally, but maybe a friend of the client or a relative of theirs has certain things lying out. You want to make sure that that's not seen. Um, so these are all different things, noises and distractions. Make sure their kids are in a different room with the door closed. The TV is not on because Dog. these are all distractions. You know, you're in the middle of the deposition. Usually you could take your, your client outside if there's a, hasn't a question, hasn't happened, isn't pending, and you can kind of talk things over. What do you do if you want to do that? Okay, here what you have to do is you have to teach them how to use the mute button, but I'm still a little paranoid about that. Right. So let them go into another room and you could talk on the phone. Look, right now, theoretically, you could use this thing where everybody else is muted. You were just chatting privately with your client. I don't trust it. I'm paranoid. I'd rather they call me separately on the cell phone. And then we go back in after the break, make sure it's muted and the camera is off while you're having your break. Okay. What is, what is the biggest problem that you had to really, that just seems to be coming up over and over again that you just can't seem to get real traction on? Is there one particular thing that you're always like, oh my God, I'm worried about this? It's a couple things. One is that you have to really speak slowly, you, the witness, everybody. Otherwise, it's too much of a problem and the screen can freeze if you don't have good internet. Your client might be using their cell phone with a little teeny screen. So it can be hard for them. Now that could be good, that could be bad because let's say the defense attorney wants to question them and beat them up on a picture or on a document. Can't see it. It's too small. Not good quality. So these are things. The other thing is it's harder. When I question a defendant, um, sometimes I become their friend. Sometimes I'm intimidating to them. It's hard to do either online. Does it look like the insurance companies are amenable to at least doing these? Because I find in my office we've had a little pushback. They're not ready, can't find the client, or they're not comfortable, or they really want to see my client in person, which may not happen for a very long time. Are you getting push back the other way or not? Yes, really? but what's happening is um, the lower courts, I know three different um, lower court decisions post COVID where they've directed remote depositions. And the law is very clear, you can't have the remote deposition. And what's really happening is the lawyer may be objecting to it because of the insurance company, but the lawyer wants to do the deposition. Absolutely. Really broke. I know a number of defense firms that have gone bust already. They want to do the depositions and bill. They have to pay lip service to the insurance company, but I think you can do it. One last question. Let's say you, you need a ruling. What do you do? Do you call well, the judge on a separate phone call or do you get them back on, on, on your, I mean, I, I'm just curious about that. That's almost impossible these days because you really can't get the judges in their home anyhow. So you're going to have to just mark it for ruling and deal with it later. All right. Uh, any final thoughts where, we, you know, we're in this whole new landscape. I don't know where we're going. Um, best tip you could give to some young lawyers now who are right out of school. They're being thrown into these video depositions because there's no appearances in court. What would you tell them? Practice in advance. Don't just think you can ad lib it. Even if you're younger and you're more facile with the technology, your client may not be. Are your documents ready? Are you ready? You really have to be more prepared. All right. Well, the family says hello. You've been you're wonderful, Bob. As always, stay healthy, stay happy, you're and uh, next time we see, it's going to be in the studio, hopefully. Right. All right. Thanks again, Bob. To Bob Jen. Sorry, we'll be back with more today's verdict right after this. Hey, I'd like to thank our viewers for joining us, and of course, you, the viewers, for watching. If you have any questions about today's show or would like to see a future topic discussed, please email me at davidlashabronxnet.org. From all of us at today's verdict, always remember, know your issues, learn the law, reach a verdict with us. We'll see you next time.